I'm on a journey to get better, and I want to do it with you. And I'm not just focusing on physical health. I'm focusing on everything, emotional wellness, spirituality, finances, relationships, and so much more. Every week, it will be my personal goal to bring us, the world's leading healers, experts, and game changers, to share groundbreaking secrets and tips to getting better in all areas of life. Getting better isn't easy, but it's a whole lot easier when we can do it together. Welcome to Better Together with me, Maria Menino. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. It is Monday, May 18th, 2020. It's my husband's half birthday. What? Celebrate, everybody. Um, my best friend and my husband share the same birthday. So when I was on the phone with her this morning, um, Kevin was like, oh, my God, it's our half birthday. <laughs> which he would have never known if our friend Roxy Stryer did not um, make him aware of that. But it is indeed his half birthday. Uh, with that said and out of the way, it was very important business to get to. Our quote of the day, there is no happiness like that of being loved by your, by your fellow creatures and feeling that your presence is an addition to their comfort. Charlotte Bronte. There's no happiness like that of being loved by your fellow creatures and feeling that your presence is an addition to their comfort. Ooh, that's a really good one. I want I want my friends to be comfortable. I want my friends to be comfortable too, and I really wish Jeff could speak and we could hear him. He's, he's uh -oh. there. Now we hear him, but he was talking and he, yeah. I like to squelch Jeff. <laughs> I don't want Jeff's imprint on this why show. Why do we still have so many technical issues? Like, why can't we just figure this out? Like, he's lit. We decorated this weekend, Kevin and I. You, you can't unmute. You can't just hit unmute, Jeff. Is that the problem? No, it's because it's because I, I prefer... You mute him? It's I you? prefer Jeff to mute himself, but he said that, no, Stephen, you do it on the mixer, and then I'm getting all the so things started. So you forget started, to mute him. And I forget to bring the levels up to have Jeff talk again. Well, then I think you need to give Jeff the power back. Jeff, you got to take, take the, the power, power back. back. I, can, I can mute. I can mute. I think you can handle it. I believe in you, Jeff. I got this. I'm, I'm on it. I'll but mute I, from here on out. I will say I'm enjoying seeing Jeff look handsome with real color oh. in his face and not like an apparition <laughs> that just happens to be somewhere talking with us. It's very cool. nice. Yeah, I am so impressed. I mean, this is Captain Kev. You guys, well, you know, Mr. Patreon for you Patreon listeners are aware, but <laughs> Kevin um, really is, when we talk about he builds things, he's a director, cinematographer, producer, but also a set decorator. That is the art that I think, you know, he talks about his 20s. He is uh, public about it. He worked as a carny. And I think a lot of those building handyman instincts combined with his creativity are what allow for this type of creation. Yeah, he's a Renaissance man. My he husband. Really is. He's he's a visionary. So he had my dad, those um right above your head, it's like one of those closed locked billboards, um, bulletin boards, so you can like privatize whatever you've written notes wise and stuff. So they put the lattice on top of it. And then when I couldn't find Kevin yesterday, because usually I just have to look for a laptop and I can find him or a cord and I follow the cord and I see where he is working. But yesterday, at some point, he left his computer and started doing this. So I went in and helped him. And, you know, I had the finishing touches and then I look like the hero. But <laughs> that teamwork. is that. Yeah, I think you do all the work, Maria. I think you, you know do what? it all. I'd like to start that rumor. Yeah, it's all you, me. Kevin doesn't do it all. This whole you, studio. You do it all. This whole studio was me. I built everything. Um, but your shot looks looks so great now. Um, oh. I mean, my my vision for putting up that you know that wall covering with the trees obviously didn't happen. But I do believe someday I'm going to get my way. <laughs> we're getting we're taking baby steps because now we have vines and lemons yeah which is like the baby step towards uh trees and but the nature. truth is this matches this and really you're if i just kicked a hole in the wall right here you would see jeff he's right there basically <laughs> but uh safely away and right. um safely away is is uh an interesting thing right now is parts of the world are opening up you know like I, I've been hearing a lot of people fleeing California because they're frustrated with our uh, intense measures. And, you know, at the same time, so like I was just talking to my friend this morning, she's like, well, people, my friends from other states are sending me pictures of, you know, bars that are open and restaurants. And, you know, it's kind of a weird thing, right? And 
how do we grapple with the idea that other places are able to be open and some aren't? And how are we handling all of this moving forward? Because to me, even if things open up, I'm not going. No, not at all. Well, because you have your parents, you can't. Yeah. But like, but also if I didn't have my parents, even for myself, I have asthma and I would be worried about how brutal that would feel <laughs> naturally, as this is something that attacks the lungs very viciously, similar to the murder hornets attacking. Um, anyway, I, I wonder, you know, for me, and everybody's different, for me, even if they say it's okay, yes, I get what they're trying to do. Like the world can't shut down forever, but wouldn't you wanna wait a minute and just see what happens in the blowback, right? Like there are the people who are adamant. I need to go. I need to get out. I need to live and whatever. I, I'm i one of those people who's kind of cautious and I want to kind of just see because nobody wants that pain of that illness. That that does not sound fun at all. I think if we had a, a like an amazing way of communicating with our citizens that like actually told them real information and didn't like muddle it with all sorts of crazy stuff. I think right now everyone doesn't really trust anything they've heard. So, yeah. you know, whether or not, I mean, I'd say 50% of the country believes that this mm -hmm. thing doesn't e isn't even as bad as it is. And then the other 50% thinks it's way worse than it is. Mm -hmm. So even if we open up, you're, you're part of that 50% that's cautious, but the other 50% is going to go balls out and do whatever because yeah. you know everyone's been lying to everyone for the past three months it's kind of scary yeah but like wouldn't you want to wait till the dust settled a little bit <laughs> i don't think people can wait i think i i don't think it's a choice at this point i think that um you know we're we're very fortunate to be in the positions that we're in currently um but i know people who literally are on the verge of homelessness because of this and even if all the people who have waitressing jobs and busing jobs and all these jobs in the food industry, do you really think that the, the tips are going to be what they used to be? Do you really think that their standard of living can be what it used to be? Well, that's the, the argument where I keep seeing on Twitter that people are making more money on unemployment than they would at their jobs. So they're probably not even going to go take those jobs. Well, you, you would... If that's true. And again, I don't know what's true anymore. I don't think... Yes, people are on un unemployment, making more money than they did at their jobs, but not everyone is on unemployment. And it, it kind of comes in waves. It's not like you sign up and you're immediately on unemployment and everything's dandy. It's like you apply, you get it, and then you have to wait your turn to get it if you're applying in the next wave and all things like you, they still have to work out the system. It's not mm -hmm. like a fully automated system. So for every job that has somebody that can get unemployment and they can lay back and be relaxed, there's another two or three people who yeah. literally are freaking out right now. Well, I, I, yeah, and I get that. So like there are people who don't have jobs, don't have that. I'm saying for people who do and you have that choice. They might be more cautious because they can be. Yeah. And I, and that's where, that's where I'm kind of coming from. And that's what the conversation I was having today was like, it was like, yeah, we kind of want to wait and see where the dust settles before. I also think, though, Maria, even a lot of those people, I think irresponsibly want to go to a bar. You know, they're yeah. feeling and it's tough because I think until you probably get COVID, it's hard to empathize with how brutal that experience is. I think a lot of people are still thinking about it like the flu. And I kind of get that temptation because it's hard to imagine a world in which something spread so easily could feel so brutal. We're not trained or conditioned for that type of thinking. So like, I think for the people who are like, you know, I really want to go to a barn in my twenties, I'll risk it. I think a lot of people have that mentality still. And until they get it, they're going to lean into that, you know, flippancy. Yeah. I yeah. I mean, I, listen, it's, it's, it's a really tough time. By the way, our guest today is going to help us through a lot of this. Um, Katarina Blum, she is a Swedish happiness psychologist. She even created a um, gym for building your uh, your mind, right? Your happiness mm -hmm. muscles with your mind. I mean, there's a whole thing behind it. It's, it's so cool. Um, but I feel like we're all, 
I mean, I know me and Kevin and Kevin for sure feels like he's spinning his wheels sometimes. Like sometimes he's up, then he's down and I'm, I'm kind of riding that roller coaster with him. And by the way, I'm holding my crystal thing. Sorry, this, in case you're wondering what this little thing is, I've really been enjoying it. It feels like calming. People want to know where you got it. Uh, Susie Patisse got it for me and it's got all these little crystals attached to it. And I don't know how you're properly supposed to use it, but I do feel good when I'm holding it. And so I just kind of grab onto it. Um, I will look it up and find in more information. But um, but I feel like that too sometimes. Like I feel like, okay, we're doing it all right. And then you're like, Grah! like the rest of the year is going to look like this. Like, no. you know, I, I had planned for my birthday this year. I wanted to go to Mount Chasta. It's like this like spiritual ground. And I was going to take a few close friends and do this whole thing and you're like okay yeah um i will be and listen it's not i don't care it's my birthday it's fine i've had a lot of great birthdays but you know you my best friend is back east she is desperate to come visit and i can't let her come visit and i want to see her i'm desperate to see her um and you know it's just it's really hard to grapple with the idea that this could go on and on and on um you know my parents are desperate to go home how do i get them home safely how yeah. how does that even happen um it's there's so many things and and it's only been two months <laughs> guys oh. it's only been two months it feels like it's been a lot longer i will say some some um some news from the good news movement who we're going to be partnering with um and jeff will tell us all about that in a bit but today italy opened up for business after two months of lockdown they opened shops museums hairdressing salons and churches all businesses are enforcing social distancing restaurants for example have to adhere to placing tables six and a half feet apart which that sounds really cool from a privacy standpoint, by the way. Yeah. I used to hate when you go to the restaurant and you couldn't even have a conversation because you knew that people would be potentially eavesdropping. Anyway. Food runners are rejoicing. Um, and uh, they have to keep a log of the clientele. Um, one hairdresser said people have been calling nonstop and, of course, asking to be first on the list. Gyms, pools, cinemas will reopen May 25th. And in Spain, the government is allowing tourism for the end of June. So I guess you can travel to Spain by the end of June. In Greece, citizens can travel freely to the islands, shopping malls, zoos, and sports facilities have opened. So this is what I'm saying. Like, if you can wait and watch, <laughs> like, I'm in the wait and watch category. Like, I think, you know... Um, I don't know, for someone who can be impatient, I'm going to be exercising a lot of patience. Um, but Maria, like, we could do company retreat to Greece for like 50 bucks a ticket. Is it $50 a ticket? I mean, it's like, no, it's, not. it's 19 bucks to fly to Texas right now. So like, I would say- $19, shut up. $19. There's no way. Yeah. There's no way two an airline weeks, would actually weeks. fly the plane for $19. Airlines have to fly the planes. They yeah. don't have a choice. They don't oh, get their yeah. bailout if they don't fly the plane. So oh, they, that's right. they're selling it for whatever. Did we just have an earthquake? No, I just stepped. No, I'm just kidding. I don't. I didn't feel anything. Huh. I don't feel it either. Maybe I'm just dizzy. I Maybe just you're felt. just completely off kilter by the $19, 19 plane ticket. Yeah, it knocked me off my feet. $19, damn. I would imagine that they're going to do every single thing in their power to make it attractive to fly to, to Spain, to fly to all these places for yeah. tourism, because most of their income is tourism. Yeah. So I think people who travel this year, if they open up, I would say you could probably have a three or four week trip to Spain for under two grand. Wow. That's what I would wager. Wow, wow, wow. Well, we shall see. Um... Did anybody watch the Beverly Hills Dog Show this weekend? I saw it on your story. Mm -hmm. Popped it on. Maria, it was weird to flash back to a time before all of this. That's what yeah. I want. Do you feel like it was like almost surreal for you to be like, whoa, the world was like that when I filmed it? Guys, in my photo album, it's those pictures of that. And then maybe one more. And then it was quarantine time. Yeah. Um, I remember doing an interview with Megan Trainer for the show. 
um, which if you haven't heard it, she was um, really raw as well. And and it was a great interview with her. And I think it was just a couple of days later, we were in quarantine. But when we were at the dog show, the way, when I look at that picture or the pictures from that, it does feel like, oh my God, what an innocent time. <laughs> and I have the same feeling with my mom. Like before she got diagnosed, I have one picture of me on the set of E! News and I'm, you know, being silly and goofy. And you just see just like I'm just happy and having fun. And I always look at that picture and then I see the next day. And the next day was just snaps of my phone researching brain tumors and things from when I was on the plane. And then just boom, life changes. Wow. And I look back on it often. And the same thing with this. I look back and I'm like, oh, what an innocent and blissful time playing with the dogs, having no idea there's this thing called the coronavirus um, and and how quickly life changes. And, you know, as I just talked to my different friends, it's everyone is is starting to get so down. And I have been seeing people say, um, you know, like we're going to be depressed either way, right? This gets worse. Mm-hmm or we get it or it's kind of like we're now starting to get into a little bit of a no-win scenario um but that's why we have katarina on the show today to help us figure out how to use physical kind of um steps not just positive thinking actions to create happiness um in our lives and i will tell you last night I think I got most of Kevin's attention to watch 90 Day Fiance. And that gave me great happiness. Another thing that you guys cannot share with me, as terrible co-hosts, none of you watch, even though you know it's my favorite show. I watched, ooh, get this. What? I watched part of the tell-all. How? So somebody leaked, somebody on their team leaked the 10 hours of unedited footage from their tell-all. You're joking. I am not joking. <gasps> I need it in my life. And some of it is the most cringeworthy and hilarious things you'll ever see. And I will tease, I'm not going to give any spoilers to anyone, but like I will tease that the interactions between David and Big Ed are on an epic scale David. hilarious. Leather coat David? David with... Uh, Catfish David, but not yeah. actually catfish. But like, wow! Yeah. Oh my god, I can't Big, wait. Like, it's hilarious seeing Big Ed give him crap. It's like, oh my god, and he gets so upset. I'm gonna say, I like dove up out of bed and was like grabbing Kevin and punching him, and like, what the heck are we watching? It's so good, so good. It's reality TV has really upped its game. I think I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, but I'm in the Vanderpump Rules Vortex. It is, again, I'm like, you know, it's people tend to categorize there's prestige drama and there's reality TV, but all t- television is valid. That's part of Maria's philosophy. And that's part of the reason After Buzz TV exists. But I can love, you know, I can love The Wire just as much as I love Vanderpump Rules, and mm-hmm. I'm not going to apologize for it. I agree. I agree. Yeah. All right. What were you gonna say, Stephen? I was gonna say that I'll get you the uh, I'll get you the ten hours so you can kill a day. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I wish I had ten hours in a day to watch it all, but I will I will slowly chip away at that, and I will very much enjoy it. Um, although I'm sad for them that they had a breach, but damn, like that's good content. I I just am so like it is so. Here's the biggest thing with Ninety Day Fiance that blows me away, is. The fact that people do not self-reflect at all. So Big Ed decides to withhold very important information from this young girl that he's going over to marry, who's I think like 20 years younger than him. And she has a child and her dream is to have a second child. And he decides, yeah, not going to let her know that I don't want to have kids because I want to have sex with her. And really, that's the bottom line. That was messed up. Like, right? I thought you were talking about the height, but then, yeah, that was, like, messed no, up. he lied about his height, okay? He lied, he he just keeps on lying. And then on top of it, decides to publicly humiliate her, telling her her breath stinks, that her hair, she's got hairy legs, she needs to shave. I mean, like, he he definitely, and I like, I, I love Big Ed, but Big Ed made some 
some errors along the way. And then their, their talk to camera is, you know, I thought this was real. I guess it's not. And it's like, no, mother effer, you lied. And now we go to Jeffrey. Jeffrey, another country here from. Jeffrey decides not to tell Varya that he went to jail and had a criminal background. So he drops the mom just before he goes to meet her mom. The mom freaks out. She's super close with the mom. And then he decides he's going to propose to her and thinks that she's going to say yes. Okay. And now it's, you know, I thought love was real and it's not real. No, you lied. That's why she said no. And you know what? She still loved you and would have said yes eventually. You just got to give her a little bit of time to process this. Everybody's so on their timeline. I'm traveling out here. I have to do this now. No, you don't have to do this now. Right? Every good relationship has a foundation of deception, Maria. No! <laughs> they don't. I just... Better together with Maria Menounos. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, oh my gosh. These people have no clue. And then they convince themselves that they're the victims in the story and I was like, no, you are not the victim. They are. You lied so you could have sex with her. You... That's why it's such good reality, though. I, it's, it's, it's brilliant reality. Okay, then you go to David. David sends pictures to Lana of him in front of a Lamborghini or some super high-end car that you know he does not own. So she falls in love with a guy she thinks has a lot of money, and he doesn't at all. And doesn't, like, uh, 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 again, deceptive. It's all deceptive. But that's the, that's, the, that's the world we live in nowadays, though. It's like everyone's putting on this persona for their social media, and that's what they believe they are, and they can't call the foe off. They can't yeah. call it off. Okay. Then you go to, what's his name? Uh, uh, Australia boy. Shoot. Oh, yeah, yeah. The really, like, intense. The stare. pinned eyes guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's not taking anything, I'm sure. Um, he lied a lot, too. So he lies and doesn't tell her that he, he tells this girl who is flying all the way to Australia to be with him and hopefully get engaged and whatever and blend families. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I divorced years ago and um, and my you know, ex-wife is totally okay with you taking, with us taking my son to America to live. So she's building this like life out. She gets there and he's just lying and lying and lying and then lied. Okay. They only divorced a year ago, which was understandable that they just hadn't gotten around to it. So all he had to do was explain that properly. Fine. But you lied and told a girl that you were going to be able to move to America with your son and the wife, the ex-wife is like, hell no, not happening. Well, his, his job was also kind of crazy. I mean, like his opinions were like, ugh. I, I honestly, I, I'm so blown away by all these people. And he's like, well, I was, I was trying to be positive about it. You're playing with people's lives and dreams and, 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 and it's expensive to fly out to Australia. It's expensive to like, Try to live this long distance relationship. I don't understand what gets through people's heads. I just don't. Producers. <laughs> I mean. Except at the same time, it's the casting that's really brilliant on the show. <sighs> that's They're the ones who deserve Emmys, are reality TV casting directors, because. 90 Day Fiance is the greatest reality show, period, end of story. They are brilliant filmmakers, the way they do all of this. And yes, they cast the best people. And I'm seeing in the chat, someone's asking, Michael is asking which 90 Day Fiance season to start with. So as a TV doctor uh, at AfterBuzz TV, I often suggest the first season of Darcy and Jesse. Just start there and keep going and then watch the before the 90 days, watch every franchise so you can see Jenny and Submit. I can't wait for that one to start up. Um, I don't even remember what that franchise is called, but you know, uh, I, whew, okay. I just purged all my 90 day fiance stuff. You needed that. I really did. Cause I just don't understand. You know, if you're, if you're looking at a relationship and you just think it's them, <laughs> it's probably really more you than anything. So take a step back, people take some ownership. If you lied, there's Probably a reason they're reacting. Okay. So, Katarina Blum. 
Is it Blom, um, Jeff? Blum, Am I saying just, right? Exactly. Okay. Katarina Blom, yes. Okay. Katarina Blom is a Swedish happiness psychologist focusing on how to create emotional wellness by taking positive action. In addition to a recent book deal, she was named Sweden's most popular lecturer in 2018. Her TED Talk has been viewed over a million times worldwide, and today she's going to share some of her most powerful science-backed habits for a happy, healthy mind. Steven, I know, is going to love these science-based tips. So, Katarina, welcome to the show. Thank you, Maria. Um, I have to ask you first and foremost, because... Um, as of just a few weeks ago, we kept hearing how Sweden and Japan had, you know, very, very mild situations with the coronavirus. I'm now hearing that that is very different. Can you yes. update us a little bit? Yes. Uh, corona is very intense here. Um, I think we have put on a slightly different strategy than most other countries, but, um, even though we have done that, it seems like a lot of people have a lot of trust in a, the way our government is handling it. And um, our chief uh, epidemiologist, is that the word? Yep, epidemiologist. Um, yeah, he uh, keeps saying that Sweden is just ahead in the curve. So other countries will get where we are, but we just decided to do things a bit faster, I think, if I understood things correctly. So... Um, yeah, so we decided to keep a lot of parts of society open in order to not get a backlash to first have it locked down and then open it and then everything will start over again. See, guys, this is what I'm talking about. This is why I'm patiently going to watch as things are opening up here. Um, I, you know, there are yeah. so many different schools of thought on this, but it's... Um, it's definitely a crazy time. And I think, Katerina, we need you more than ever because um, happiness is something that I feel like the reserves are running dry on nowadays mm. or, or we're having a difficult time staying in that state. And so you're a psychologist that focuses on these science-based facts to um, promote happiness. So why did you choose this to study first and foremost? Uh, I think um, this is something that interests a lot of people and concerns a lot of people. And of course, mental um, health uh, and mental illness is something that is very se severe. And uh, uh, even if it's severe and even if it's quite common, I think it's even more common to just have this thought of, so was this it? Is this my life? Wasn't it supposed to be anything more? Uh, that longing to have a really f fulfilled and connected life, I think that's something that touches even more people than just being an, ex an expert in how to treat uh, depression or anxiety and so on. So I wanted to um, get down deep into psychology in order to then spread it to the wider public. And I think happiness is a good subject for this. So do you feel like if someone has been diagnosed with a mental illness, that these um, kind of science-backed habits that you promote would mm. be um, effective for them? It's really good that you raised that question uh, because I think it's good to distinguish a bit. If you have a, a diagnosis with something, uh, a, a mental illness that you might have been struggling with for years, and then someone comes along and says like, oh, but uh, you know, it's good to be grateful. Uh, like it can be like a smack in the face. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it's not harmful to do the things that we're gonna talk about today, but it's good to have a lot of respect for yourself. And uh, if you are really struggling with something, I would advise to seek out the professional psychologist to talk uh, to them and get proper treatment because this is more something that you can try out and see what suits you the most and of course I think it's going to be some kind of boost but if you are struggling like please take it seriously and be really respectful of yourself and uh, it's not about just like getting your shit together mm -hmm. and like <laughs> I was like oh can I say that yes you can um, Okay, great. So it's not just about like, um, oh, you start doing this and everything's going to be all right. Like, I think things are a bit more complex than that. 
but yeah. it's not harmful. We can we can say that. That's an important distinction, but I do think it's like it's almost like a muscle you have to build. Mm, right? For sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. So let's talk a little bit about how you want to change the perception of abstraction in psychology and um, help people take kind of practical control over their emotions. Yeah, so I think uh, psychology has been in that black box for too long now. Um, now, like the last 10, 20 years, it feels like more people start going to their coaches and you can go see your therapist and you don't have to say that you have a doctor's appointment where you're really seeing a psychologist. Uh, so I think there's definitely, definitely a shift in the stigma around the mental health. But I think we could do things even more out in the clear. Like today, we know we need to eat our greens and, and the train and like exercise the body to be uh, healthy but there are really simple equivalent things that you could do to train your mind in order in order to stay emotionally healthy which i think can be even more tricky uh, these days yeah i i've you know one of the biggest reasons um i started this show was because of just that i feel like We've all put so much emphasis in our physical health, whether it's diet, you know, nutrition, mm. exercise, but it's like, what are we doing yeah. for this in here and in here, yeah. you know, your, your head and your heart and your emotional and spiritual health is so mm. important, your mental health. And I found it really interesting that you started a gym for yeah. this. Can you explain <laughs> what that, um, the genesis of that? Yeah, sure. So uh, I co-founded this psycholo psychological gym for the mind together with another psychologist. And uh, we really wanted to make psychological training easy and accessible for everyone. So you can just log on to this. Um, it's a digital gym. We're very modern. Uh, so you can just easily log in there and uh, pick what cat category that you would like to work on. Maybe it's your relationships or your um working life or your family life and it's just packed with like 400 different exercises i think and all of them are backed with science so this is not an actual like brick and mortar spot that people go to it's just online exactly <clears throat> exactly yeah would you see yourself someday building something like that i mean now with covid it's kind of hard but <laughs> you know it feels like places like that need to exist where you can just, you know, like as easily as you're going to McDonald's to drive through and get some food, you could mm -hmm. drive in, in a, in a bad moment and say, here's where I'm at. And somebody could help kind of reframe things for you and help you shift. Yeah. 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 I, I've wanted to build a place like that, to be honest, for the last couple of years. Yeah. So, um, I thought that's what you had kind of done. Ah, I see. Yeah. No, it's just uh, digital so far but we um um yeah but i think to get um to gather people and talk about what's really going on is something that we need to do a lot more in sweden it's very secular uh, and the churches are still active but not as supported as they used to be so there's this gap here where where do we go with or all our existential dilemmas because mm -hmm. we can't go to church anymore so now it's been more uh, up to you to find your own way and um, I think it's a very vulnerable model because we we shouldn't seek those answers for ourselves we should seek them as a community as a group of people mm -hmm. and I really uh, honor your way of doing this with this show I love the name better together it's like yes this Thank is you. what it's all about yeah, we are better together. You can't do anything alone. Um, mm. The other thing that you said that I really, really loved and stuck to, and I was telling my husband this this morning because um, he was having, you know, with this crisis, I feel like everybody's up and down and he has definitely been riding that roller coaster mm. up and down and um, feeling, you know, a little uneasy. And I said to him that you said that the mind is like Velcro for negativity and Teflon mm -hmm. for positivity. 
And mm. he almost dropped his coffee when I told him yeah. that. <laughs> I know. And this is something that I think all of us intuitively understand when you hear it, but we haven't really thought about it before. And I think it's so important to spread this because um, we often think about ourselves as these objective, very rational, intellectual people, like perceiving information in this objective fashion when we're really filtering our reality in so many different ways. And one of those filters is called the negativity bias, which makes us highlight the negative um, and downplay the positives in life. And of course, this is because it was very important and good to do this long time ago, back then and there when we were living with the life threats. But here and now, it's not as necessary and still our brain keeps doing this so sometimes i say that uh, your brain wants you to survive it cares less if you're a happy survivor so happiness and feeling that you, you're living this fulfilled life it's something that really um is something that we need to become a bit more proactive around uh, we can't just let our mind and our brain take the decis decisions for us um yeah so this is a lot what i'm you used to talk about. Yeah. I mean, in your TED talk, and we used um, a little bit of it and discussed it in our Patreon episode, but I feel like you were saying that, you know, when positive things happen, you know, it doesn't feel um, as good as the negative things feel bad, if I'm getting that properly. Mm. Yeah, 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 for sure. So there's studies say, saying that if you lose an amount of money and then you win the same amount of money, you won't become as happy as you become sad. So we have this emotional asymmetry where the negatives leaves a stronger mark than the equal uh, positive event. Uh, so this is really something that's good to take into account and especially now in these times of uncertainty that our mind, our brain is not very fond of uncertainty and it's very risk aversive i think the english word mm -hmm. is so uh, when uh, when we have these uncertainties our mind tends to um, uh, interpret them in this catastrophic way just in a way to make us more prepared for this potential catastrophe that might 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 happen mm -hmm. and um this is just the way of the brain. It's just by habit it does this, uh, but it can heavily affect how we feel and how much we have faith in ourselves or in the day or in our community uh, that we will um, get through this pandemic and so on. So it's really important to stay a bit constructive when your mind keeps telling you or feeding you catastrophes. And also the news are quite good at feeding you mm -hmm. the bad side of things. So I think it's really important to just become a bit more aware so you can do that slight shift like, hmm, should I really watch the news 10 times a day? Maybe it's enough with once a day or twice a day. Um, so we become more aware of um, what things influence our emotions and how our emotions influence our way of acting so or behaving. Yeah, I feel like um, it's it's hard though. Like if that if you're saying that the brain is is, um, you know, I mean we we know our brains are evolving, but they haven't really evolved past mm. you know that threat, yeah. right? That lion that was coming to eat us or whatever it was back then. And so, you know, yeah. how do we how do we override our minds? Mm. Yeah. That's a really good uh, question, and, and I um, I love. There's another metaphor uh, that I think who is it that done it? There's it's an American um, psychologist who says this um, that the brain has like an upstairs brain and a downstairs brain. Like the upstairs brain is the more evolved part of us that can take decisions and look into the future and um, picture different scenarios, the more complex mind. And the downstairs brain is the more primal part, the most, more emotional part. And uh, these two needs, there, there's a tiny staircase between the upstairs brain and the downstairs brain. And uh, we need to make this stair more and more connected mm. so that when we get emotionally 
um, something becomes emotionally intense, we need to remind ourselves to slow down, like take a breath, what is actually happening here and make these two parts of the brain connect. This could be one way of overriding uh, so that we doesn't get swept away by the uncertainties and the catastrophic thinking. Yeah. Is that Dr. Dan Siegel, Katarina? Does that sound yes. right? Yes, thank you. Uh, yes. Very small world. We're actually bringing him on the show next week. So, uh, Wait, is yeah. that who Judy God. had mentioned? It absolutely is the yeah, doctor because that Judy mentioned. As I'm Katarina was talking, I was feeling something that Judy had said about the upstairs yeah. and downstairs. That's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a great me metaphor. I just love it. Um, Stephen, I know you had a question for Katarina. Yeah, well, it's just... I've heard it before on the show how pe kind of some of these things that people do to realize when they're going towards those negative negative ways. Mm -hmm. But like with with your method, how do you realize when you need to shift? Like what is it that mm. clicks in your mind that you're like, I need to shift right now because this is not a doorway I want to open? Yeah. So I think you need to learn that backwards. So you will behave in some way, you will react in some way, and you will create some kind of consequence in your life. And the time over time, we tend to learn kind of slowly that maybe our type of reaction, our type of behavior doesn't create the type of life, the type of consequence that I want to have in my life, the type of relationship or the type of health or whatever. And uh, we need to spend a lot of time with those bad consequences until we finally learn that, hmm, maybe I can actually change this by changing my behavior and before that changing my reaction uh, but this is a slow learning curve and uh, i think a lot of it goes through being aware so practicing mindfulness or talking to your friend spending time reflecting maybe writing in a diary or just talking about your emotional life with other people are all different tools that can help you to raise more awareness around your emotional life and we need to be aware before we can do some kind of change. And some people have a partner that keeps telling them like, don't you see that always when you do this? this blah, blah, blah. And um, that can feel harsh, but uh, still this is actually a, a great help if you're ready to receive it. Uh, so it's important to, uh, yeah, to figure out what kind of consequence do I want in my life? What kind of uh relationship do i want to have what kind of health what kind of emotions yeah so yeah on. and you know tony robbins um in his seminars will always say like your happiness is equated to how much uncertainty you can actually handle mm. right which ah, is that's interesting which is is so true because we all have different thresholds for uncertainty and i feel like this is this crisis is really testing our um, our thresholds for sure. And Stephen, I think for you, one of the things that I've learned by studying Esther Hicks is that when I'm uneasy or starting to get, um, you know, um, angry or short or whatever, it's when I'm disconnected and I'm starting to kind of fall off kilter. And so that's when I know I have to go, I have a notebook and I reread all of my tools to help me get back on track, you know, like pick a good feeling thought and then, um, you know, do things that are going to be able to give me happiness very quickly. And I have that list. I know mm. the things that make me happy, smelling roses, going for a walk, playing with my mm. dogs, things you can access quickly to help start to shift you little by little out and up in the levels of kind of your consciousness. And so you can catch yourself pretty quickly because it's when you're starting to not be your best self. And then once you do that, if you have like, that's what I use as my tool is my notebook. I go to my notebook. I'm like, shit, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I read it yeah. and then yeah, yeah, I can yeah. figure out, oh, okay, this is what I got to do. Because when you're in it, it's hard to know what to do. Even if you have been working on it and training like I have. Mm. Um, so sometimes it gets dark fast. So I have my notebook with my tools and um and i go to that and that's really been helpful for me well is there is there something to face because like in my mind it, it feels like that's kind of distracting your mind from what's making you feel that way but unfortunately for me it's like i don't know 
what I'm supposed to face to stop feeling the way I'm feeling. So everything becomes a distraction because I can't face it mm. because if I do face it, I know that it's just kind of like a really dark hole to just dive down. Mm. And I don't know ah. if it's going to be something I can get out of. So it's just yeah, constantly, yeah, yeah. even if I do meditation, it's like my meditation is, okay, think about that. Nope, don't think about that because if I think about mm. that, I will not be able to get back from it. Okay, mm. we have an expert on the line who could help you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think a lot of people can recognize themselves in what you're describing. Uh, because um, feeling, um, we don't, like you said, talked about that dark hole. Having that dark hole, you don't really know what's in there. And therefore, it becomes even more scary. And we find all different creative ways to keep at bay from that dark hole. And uh, within CBT therapy, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which I am trained in, um, it's very, very important to start getting curious about that dark hole uh, and stop avoiding it because the avoidance can sometimes create more problems than actually just stepping into the dark hole. And if you are having fears around, will I ever get out? Like, will this consume me? Will I go crazy? What will happen once I get into that dark hole, it's really good to do it together with someone you really trust. So it doesn't have to be a uh, professional, but of course it can be. Uh, but if you have like a wise, wise friend who can be there with you, maybe it could be better with a professional because, because probably your mind would find different tricks to try to, in the last minute, avoid going down that dark hole. And a professional could really help you pace that uh, direction in, in yeah, in the right um, pace. Well, I think this leads to another question I have, because really it's not so much the fact of dealing with the emotions. It's dealing with the fact that I don't necessarily trust myself to know what is a reality and what is not. So when you when you dive down your insecurities and you actually face them, you're, mm -hmm. you're forced to kind of come to terms with a lot of a lot of things you don't want to come to terms with, but also a lot of things that you don't know whether or not those are true about yourself. So mm -hmm. when you dive down it, you, it's it's kind of it's not scary that you're actually going in your emotions. It's scary that you might try to start dealing with things that might not even be real. Mm. And I think that's kind of where the fear stems from, because I have no I have no yeah. issue talking about it. I have no issue going to going to somebody and talking about it. The issue I have is. I lie to myself too much to trust how my mind is telling me what I need to deal with. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is um, you need to go into those statements about yourself, even though they might be not true, in order to find out are they false or are they true. Like This is just about getting to know those dark corners in yourself that we all need to do. And um, I think... I, I would question the term about what's true and false because we as humans are so fluid. Like in one set of people, I am one kind of Katerina. In another set of people, I'm one kind of Katerina. So to talk about how to be your authentic self, I think is a bit misguided because I, I am authentic in all these different uh, constellations, even though I'm not the same. And if you have a statement, like your mind is telling you something about your insecurities or who you are, is this true or false? We don't know. Who, who are anyone to judge if this is true or false? The interesting thing is, how is this helping you or how is this hindering you in your life? Uh, where you want to be or what kind of person you want to be. So I think just to get to know what are those voices saying and don't worry about whether it's true or false. Just getting there, get comfortable comfortable with them. Uh, and then you can take a step back again and like, hmm, what does this say about me? Like, do I really want to keep having these guys around or, or should I try a new way to navigate? Wow. Does that make sense? It makes sense. It's just, it's scary when you think of like, you have to face, you have to face these thoughts, but... I, I think there's a lot of people out there that, you know, like me, couldn't face them alone just because mm. of, you know, I've dealt with depression like all my life. So it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. I fear trying to go into that without mm. having any kind of structure behind me to know, OK, I need to get out of this right now. I need to be around people right mm. now. Yeah, it's like going into mm. quicksand. 
Yeah, I just I don't want to put myself in a mindset that destabilizes myself to the point that I can't get out of it. Yeah, I think that sounds very wise. Like that's you're talking from not just a, a thought or like an idea. You're talking from experience. Like I've been there. I've been in that hole. I know how hard it is to get out if I don't have some kind of structure. So I think it sounds really wise, and I really think. Um, going there together with someone or in a structured way that you feel more safe with. I just I love think, what you said yeah. about um, how fluid we are and mm. how we're different with different people. And I feel like that is something that we've not ever discussed on this show that I'd love to explore more because as I was thinking about it, I'm like, yeah, when you're with a certain person where you feel more confident, you can maybe be more of your authentic self. And then when you don't feel as confident with this person, maybe you're mm -hmm. not going to be as, as, you know, bold and whatever. Or I, I feel like there are so many different layers to why we are the way we are with certain people. And I think that Definitely. that gives you a forgiveness of, like, I feel like we want to describe ourselves in such rigid terms. Now just hearing what you just said when mm. in reality, we're not rigid, we're people and we have, you know, emotional states that can affect us and change us in so many ways. And, yeah. you know, and, and horoscopes, we're Gemini, Stephen. Um, so, so that, <laughs> you know, whether we believe in the dualities or not, sometimes I feel like I'm both people. Like sometimes mm. I feel like I can be both things or I see both sides of everything. And maybe that is, you know, an astrological thing, but um, I, I just think what you just said is so important to, to dive into a little bit. Yeah, I really like that you um, want to highlight this because I, I uh, haven't talked about it uh, that much, but I strongly believe this. And uh, I think that we have a misconception about uh, feelings, for example, just saying like, today I'm happy, like, okay, but really you're saying like, in this moment, I'm happy because the next moment we have no idea what we're going to feel. And uh, our emotional states go, they're so fluid as well. And our thoughts are so fluid and they change so rapidly. And um, I think also we, we as species, we as humans are very heavily influenced by the context that we're in. So uh, right now when I'm here, like trying to be a bit more formal, get my studies right, put on like Katerina, psychologist, um, and uh, this is also a genuine part of me. So this is not just a role, this is me. And it's the same when I'm gonna go see my partner later tonight, uh, that's also me. And um, I think sometimes we strive so hard to fit into a label or into a personality that we always desired, where it, it's just too tight, like it's a too tight costume and we need to just cut those <laughs> ribbons open and uh, just be fluid. Um, I think that's a more just to ourselves. Yeah. And I feel like when you think about like shadow work, mm -hmm. um, I think that that would probably lend itself so much to accepting your shadow self um, mm. as well. Don't you think? Yeah, definitely. And that's like we were talking to Stephen earlier, like getting to know your dark corners is really the only way to accept them and learn to live with them. And it's first when we know what we're dealing with that we can actually transform something. So uh, uh, definitely uh, also like throughout life, so many things happen uh, and different relationships affect us so heavily and different life events so are we really the same person just in the beginning of the year as we are in the end of that year um like what happened to you i heard about your story with the the brain tumor and how that shifted so many things in your life but already before that you were shifting mm -hmm. to become like everything was perfect so that this brain tumor would affect you in this way that it did and um, this is something that keeps happening all the time wow I'm curious, because um, when we talk about fluidity with, you know, who you are and how you act and, and authenticity, how does that cater to when you're trying to change yourself for the better, right? Is that still a version mm -hmm. of you, even if you're trying to actively denounce a previous version of you to 
to mm -hmm. re rewrite it with a new version that's better. I think it's less about denouncing and more about growth, right? Yeah, like um, I think when we resist something, like there's that saying, when you resist, it, it persists. persists. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. And um, I really think um, there's nothing wrong in wanting to change. And uh, when you're curious about new versions of yourself, or maybe you find that you have this behavior or this habit that isn't serving you anymore or isn't helping you anymore. Uh, so there's... Um, Again, I I wouldn't say that something is better than the other. It just functions differently for us in different times in our life. So the interesting question is what what are my actions and behaviors are actually providing in my life? Like what are actually providing and well functioning for me according to where I want to be or who I want to be as a person? And then there's no right or wrong in like who I want to be or where I want to be. It's just different behaviors going to serve that purpose better or not as good. That makes sense. So cool. So you actually have exercises for finding happiness. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure we go through your PERMA exercise to make sure that we give oh, yeah. people active tools and tips that maybe they'll put in their notebook. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm going to throw these in my notebook for sure to, um, to promote happiness in your life. Great. So the first thing I'd like to point out is that I don't personally believe that there is a state called happiness. And this is a bit ironic since I talk about happiness all day long. Uh, but I think it's important to get the framing right that um, happiness is just an emotion as other emotions, uh, anger or sadness or being afraid. And it comes and goes quickly. So um as uh, striving for happiness is uh, something we can do, but it's important to uh, know that there is no way that I can conserve a, a certain emotion. Like, for example, when we get married, we hope that we will love this person for the rest of our lives, but we won't be able to conserve that passion or love that we felt in the beginning. And uh, um, creating happiness in your life, it's a bit like, uh, having a good night of sleep like you cannot control your um, ability to sleep like I can't just tell myself now I'm gonna sleep or now I'm gonna be happy or now I'm gonna be in love like I can't control my emotions on that level and sometimes we tend to talk like that would be possible uh, so I think it's important to focus on um, like what can I do to prepare my mind or prepare my emotional body for love or for happiness or for going to sleep, if you want to have a more concrete example. Uh, like I can put out the lights in the room, I can ha open a window, I can make sure that I've been running during the day and that will put me to bed uh, better. And it's the same with happiness. So I can try and do different things, take different actions, but we can't really like, I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna be happy. So we can do yeah. different things just to increase the likelihood that we will experience positive emotions. That's another thing that's actually fascinating that you just said is, you know, when you look at it like, okay, it's just another emotion in the list. Mm. If you told me I had to be angry all day, I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Right. If exactly. you told me I had to be yep. sad all day, I couldn't do that. So why yeah. are we thinking that we can make ourselves be happy all day when it doesn't apply to the other things? Holy moly, exactly. what a breakthrough. Yeah, ah, you put it down so well. This is so important for me. I know it, it puts so much pressure on us to constantly have that happy feeling. And it's biologically impossible. Like, don't even try. But of course, we long for that. and We want to be in that. But we need to have it like with a, hold it with a light hand. Like, uh, uh, this is something I am longing for, but I won't push away sadness or anger or being afraid when those feelings arise because they deserve equal am amount of attention uh, again coming back to what resists persists if i try to push those away like no happiness happiness <laughs> i think you're gonna find yourself kind of stuck and not feeling very alive wow that's another huge aha moment mm. i mean yeah like why would we think that we could create a dominant 
emotion. I mean, I feel like I, I do feel like we can hold on to it for a certain time. Like I have produced a cry here or there where, for example, I mean, think about it actually in a different way. Actors can make themselves cry, but I know that at different times when I was flooded with emotion, I would look at the calendar and be like, okay, I have a day off in a month and I'm going to cry then. And that's what I would do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I do believe yeah. we have a little bit of control over our mm -hmm. emotional state. I, I mean, actually, I think we have a lot of control, which is the whole point of here are some tools to access happiness. But I think it, again, frees us a little bit of the notion <clears throat> that we can live in Disneyland in our minds all day. Definitely. So I love that framing. Like you could look at it as a relief. Like I don't have to be happy all the same time, but I, there are things I can do to increase the likelihood that I will experience more positives, but it's important that I, I do that in a tender way, not in a grabby way. And that I also keep my heart open to experience all the other emotions that are part of the human experience. And also sometimes I feel like um, uh, we don't pay enough respect to the negative emotions uh, because they're vital for us that we sometimes experience them so that we don't become numb. Mm -hmm. So that life isn't just like a straight line, like, like every day is sunny and I live with my husband and my life is kind of okay and I got everything I need. Like it just becomes boring and we don't stay alive. So we need to feel some uh, anger and uh, like different emotions in order to also really enjoy when things are going great for us. And not just enjoy it, but evolve and grow because it's through mm. the tough times that you see who you are, who the person is, let's say, next to you in your relationship or your friends and how they helped you in that moment or didn't help you. And, you know, I think that's, you know, that's the cycle of life, right? As we're evolving, we're growing, we're adjusting, we're shifting, we're morphing and and we're having an experience, but Definitely. you know, not, yeah. not that we can't just have that. Wow. This is really profound. Yeah. Just like one tone of life, one emotion or life, like that would be horrible. We would stop feeling, I think we really numb, numb out. And, um, and I really like what you said that, uh, it's through those hardships that we get to be really vulnerable with each other. Mm -hmm. And it's only when I show myself and my vulnerability that it will evoke other people's compassion and I will get to have that intimate moment of wow I'm not alone here I I'm having this hardship and someone is on the other side saying I see what you're dealing with I I know I've been there I, I want to be there with you and that kind of uh, experience is also so fundamental to um, just life and what it's like to be a human I yeah. think so, so the, the bads are really opening up for connection as well. So cool. Okay. So let's go. Cause I can't let you go <laughs> and we're running out of time. I can't let you go without learning about PERMA. So explain yeah, so, to everybody what PERMA is. PERMA is uh, one uh, big model of well-being that was uh, founded by, um, uh, Martin Seligman, who is also like the father of positive psychology, the the study of uh, of happiness, basically. And PERMA is an acronym where all uh, letters stand for one aspect of well-being. So if you would like to invite more of well-being into your life and and start taking action towards that, you can have PERMA as a guiding inspiration, for example. Okay, so let's go to P. Okay. P stands for positive emotions. So this is the most basic, uh, like the thing that people think about when they think about happiness, just having this warm, fuzzy feeling in their chest. And uh, this is something that's really brief, like you experience it and then it's gone again. Yeah. E. Do you want me to give some tips for exercises? Or yes, yes. Yeah, for each one, if you can yeah. explain the letter and then the exercise, that would be great. Okay, so under P, I would just say um, 
what have you done previously in order to ignite that tiny positive emotion? Like you were mentioning smelling the roses, for example, or for me, I love to eat my baked bread. <laughs> like I don't bake it. I'm horrible in the kitchen, but I love to buy really good bread. So that's uh, a, a daily um, savoring moment for me. So uh, here you can ask yourself questions like, how can you treat yourself today? How can you um, uh, savor some part of your everyday life? Like yeah, I some, sniff my like coffee that. grinds every time. I'm like ready to make yeah. my coffee. I'm like, oh, it smells so good. Uh, I guess I'm very like into scents. That's <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, so it can be anything that is uh, like um, sense based, actually, um, like having a nice bath or a, a long shower or singing or dancing, like anything that just evokes positive emotions. So that's P. The next one is E, and it stands for engagement. So here um, you can ask yourself, when do I feel really engaged in an activity? Um, when do I even experience flow, for example? Because flow is a concept that's been studied and um, uh, shown that it's well connected with uh, positive emotions. What do you mean by flow? So flow is when you're doing something and you're doing it so intensely and you feel almost um, immersed into this activity that you yourself, you can't think about anything else than just doing this activity. For example, um, we often think about artists that are experiencing flow or like rock climbers or um, someone, someone playing the piano in this very elegant way are experiencing flow. And the cool thing about flow is that we are performing at the height of our capacity while still being kind of relaxed and at ease. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's really cool. And I think flow could be nice to... Um, to use right now during the pandemic as a way of just shutting out everything else and just going into one activity that totally captures you and takes your attention. Got it. Mm. And the most important thing to create flow is that the level of challenge on this activity uh, in a perfect way matches your level of competence in performing the activity. Mm, yeah, because so, if you're going above your skill, you're going to be frustrated. You're not going to be in flow. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And otherwise, you'll be bored and yeah. you'll start to think about what should I buy tomorrow or blah, 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 blah. Interesting. Things. Okay. Mm. Okay, should we keep going? Yes. So we got the R, which stands for positive relationships. And uh, this is one of the um, strongest, strongest factors connected to happiness that we do have functioning relationships in our life. And uh, I think this can be really tricky right now during the pandemic that you feel isolated or maybe you feel like you're stepping on top of your family and it creates a lot of friction in the family unit that you keep staying very close by um, in this lockdown. Um, but having good supportive relationships are really important for our well-being. And uh, as we talked about this earlier, it's not important that we have like loads of friends, but that we have a few that we can really be open, honest and vulnerable with. Yeah. So you can just think about, like you were saying earlier, some friends may invite me to become more of me and some friends uh, I feel a bit more tense around. Maybe they... Uh, trigger my perfectionism or uh, trigger my um, high achieving side. Uh, so you can really think about what kind of friends or people do I have in my life that uh, invites me to become even more relaxed, even more feeling even more safe. Like these are the relationships that you really want to nurture during the pandemic, I would say. Yeah. And I feel like in your talk, you had mentioned that the relationships we really get our, our, our kind of highest fulfillment from are the ones where we can be most vulnerable and that makes a lot of sense, but I don't think we think mm. about it like that when, you know, in life, I think if we were to look at our friends in that way, we would realize why it's not necessarily the best scenario or why it's something, it's missing something. So if you're thinking about mm. it in those terms, it's like, well, 
am I really vulnerable with this person? Can I share? Will they even listen? Do they have ADD and not paying attention to whatever I'm saying? Cause they, you know, whatever, like, yeah, yeah. I, I think if we look at it through that lens, um, we'd probably be able to have even more meaningful connection. I, I really agree on that. Definitely. Okay. So that's our M. Yeah. M is meaning. And I personally really like this, uh, this uh, part of well-being because the positive emotion is something that you think about immediately like uh, how can i snuggle a puppy or like uh, uh, like you said like smell the roses like uh, this is something we think about with um, happiness and that we should feel the happiness but meaning it's like we can do something and we can struggle and we can uh, have that blood sweat and tear moment and we keep doing this thing because not that it feels good, but that it gives us meaning. And um, uh, this is a bit more of a like a long term aspect of happiness. Uh, it, it's not something that's just in the moment. It's something that keeps coming back into our life. Like, for example, sometimes I say uh, I give the example of having kids like I had my son one and a half years ago and um, uh, it's not always a pleasure having kids, but it definitely gives you meaning in life. And um, here it's important to think about like, what are the things I can uh, delve into that contributes to something bigger than just myself? Uh, this is something that typically gives us meaning. Uh, it could also be showing, um, showing compassion and caring for other people caring for your community, caring for your neighbors. Maybe you can show it right now by just donating some money to uh, an organization. Or uh, in Sweden, we have different uh, uh, pop-up factories to create uh, protective clothing for um, uh, people at the hospitals because there is not enough. So you can definitely find different ways to create more meaning into your life right now. Um, and then we have the a which stands for achievement so this is about when do you feel competent during the day like sometimes right now it can be hard if your working life has been um, limited and uh, um, and it's important to just find those tiny moments maybe when you feel proud or when do you feel that you're in control of of your day uh, when do you feel that you can really achieve something in a way that makes you proud can be guiding questions mm -hmm. for the A. And then H? H is uh, our physical health uh, because uh, it's been shown that if you have a physical health, it also promotes mental health. So here you can just think about like, can I take a short stretch or a nap or eat healthy or go out for a walk or go for a run? Like how can I take care of my physical body? and promote emotional wellness in that way. So PERMA, P-E-R-M-A-H. Yes. And if we do these practical exercises, mm -hmm. we can have more happiness in our life, basically. Maybe you can try. Uh, this is something that's been shown working for a lot of people. But of course, science is not truth. You need to try it out for yourself and see what works for you in this period of your life that is quite strange. Yeah, it is definitely a strange yeah. time. Um, yeah. Before I let you go, Katerina, I have to ask you, what is one thing you are doing to get better in your life every day? I try to uh, stay connected with my friends. Mm -hmm. It's really important and it's sometimes quite difficult because um, me and my partner has taken a more conservative stance on really practicing social distancing. Uh, but I try to call any like someone at least daily and I try to stay connected through texting people and also meeting others for just walking outside uh, in the neighborhood. And I can really tell the difference on my mood. Yeah. So staying connected to close friends. And we lost Katerina. But we got what? exactly what is. we needed. What? Oh, there you are. 
staying connected with your friends. We got it. Yes. 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 Um, well, Katarina, right. thank you so much for, for joining us all the way from Sweden and um, two major aha moments in the show that um, Amazing. I am so grateful for. Um, if you guys want more information on Katarina, you can go to katarinablum.com. We'll put that in the summary of this episode and you can follow her at Katarina Blum on social media. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you virtually. Yeah, you too. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Um, that was so cool. Those were big aha moments for me. Did you guys feel like that? Yeah. It's that thing of I I what I'm finding in the show is like any way that we can invite freedom in our lives, that feels like a great way to find happiness. And totally. I feel like she gave she offered so much freedom. Like you're allowed to not be the exact same person in all spheres of your life. You're allowed to not always be happy. Like if you give yourself that permission and that freedom to just kind of float, exist, take a breath and set yourself up to try to be more happy. It's like, like she said, you're not always going to have a good night's sleep, but if you prepare your room well, you're more likely to have a good night's sleep. Yeah. We're not always going to be happy, but if we take steps and actions to set ourselves up for more happiness, we're more likely to find it. Yeah. So great. I, um, I love it. Steven, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot of good in there. Some of it's confusing, though. Like, a, a little bit of it's kind of confusing. Like, you know, the the lessons come from the experiences of pain and stuff. And I, and I get that in other aspects. But in this, it's like, well, how do we, how do we try to prevent that from happening? And yeah. it kind of just felt like, no, you got to let it happen so you can figure it out. And then you make your changes based on that. But you should be fluid and be yourself. But, like... I think the whole point of people wanting to change is that they hate themselves or that they don't want to be themselves. So like, I don't know. It was kind of, it was kind of confusing at times for me. I feel like life is just confusing in general to a degree. And, you know, wh I think what you're confusing is kind of the lemonade making of life. Right. So there are bad things that happen. And I think that they're meant to be for our growth. And so we make lemonade out of them. It's not that we're, I mean, we're trying to avoid things, but at the same time, things are inevitable. So that's where it gets a little confusing. And so inevitably bad things are going to happen, whether you prepare or not, right? Like we're preparing not to get Corona. We're doing everything we can, but you know, it, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And somehow there'll be a slip in the road. You know, like I said, that one time I was outside and I grabbed the door handle um, and I, freaked out that I had forgotten to wash my hands, right? Like it could be a freak moment like that. But I think it's, I think it's a little bit more of that. And then it's, it's giving you the latitude to evolve and change because if where you're at isn't working for you, then you need to take the steps to adjust and change. I think too, Stephen, like it's the idea of inviting people along. Like I would challenge you a lot of some of the challenge, like struggles you mentioned to Katarina, who is on that journey with you? Um, you know? I guess this show, but For aside sure. from that's like, I think that's the thing that I struggle with is like my, you keep um, it to yourself. Well, it's not so much that I keep it to myself. It's that like, I have trouble building relationships with people. I have trouble maintaining friendships and creating friendships because there is a, subconscious thought that is it is inevitable that no matter what I do I will not fit in mm. and when you look at kind of my my past history of things it's like every single thing I do I end up in the same place even with the advice of other people even when I execute even when I feel like I'm doing the things I end up relationship status quo wise kind of in the same place so it's kind of a weird self-fulfilling prophecy that's hard to deal with yeah but here's the thing Stephen. with you is you're so self-aware like most people aren't self-aware so i feel like half the battle is being self-aware so i think now what you need to do is i mean let you do whatever you want but i would engage with somebody to kind of break away those misnomers because you know we had dr amen on the show and one of the things that stuck with me is you have to ask yourself, is this 100% true? Because a lot of the things that we worry about are a complete waste of time. And that's been something that a tool in my box that I've used 
where I'm like, is this a hundred percent true? You know, we make assumptions about people and their behavior and what they're thinking and we're assuming, you know, and I think even with ourselves, I, I wake up, you know, just the other night I woke up with like serious, serious anxiety and I had to go through the process with myself. I'm like, okay, what am I worried about? Okay. Is this a hundred percent true? And it wasn't. And then I said, okay, well, guess what? When, you know, it is, I'll deal with it, but it isn't. And so why would I waste my time getting stressed and sick right now? And I think the same thing for you. Um, I think if you really went down the list, you would find that a lot of the things you think about yourself aren't a hundred percent true. Um, and the pressure you're putting yourself under yourself under is what's keeping people away. And the walls that you've built because you're so afraid or what really is keeping you from true connection with people. I mean, that's definitely true. It's just like the How do you dif- undo it? Yeah, like the difficulty lies in I'm very logical. You guys know this. Like I'm an o- I'm an overthinking logical to the point of a fault person. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of people like me out there who kind of are that way is, you know, cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. So when you keep getting the effect you keep analyzing what the cause is, and those causes become your insecurities. Whether they're true or not, you've established them in your mind. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's, it's your story. Yeah, for me, it's, you know, you can dispel them all you want, but when the effect keeps coming, the default to that cause becomes what is the reality. So you can only dispel them to a certain degree until suddenly you're like, Well, I can't really say this isn't reality because how do you decide reality? You decide reality by logically thinking what is the cause and effect. So it's kind of, it's like this weird cycle that I'll go through moments where like, okay, well, that's not true. You're too smart for yourself. I I sometimes (laughs) wish I could just go get lobotomized and just be like, be different. Like it's, it's really, it's really tough. It's not easy. It's a lot. You're in battle with yourself a lot. What I would encourage though, Stephen, is like you were just saying, I take advice from people and I try to fix things. Don't always try to fix things. I would just bring people in along for the ride and let them feel with you rather than fix you. Or, you know, it's like one of the biggest gifts I can give Laura sometimes is she'll bring a problem to me and I'll want to go in and try to fix it or make things better. And all she wants to do is be seen, Mm. be heard and like felt. So I don't know. I, I'm really bad at that. That was a big point of contention in my last relationship is I, I have a need to fix me too. I have a need to say, if somebody like again, I think it was great. What was it? Tony Robbins yeah. said where he's talking about the woman in the car who, if if your girlfriend has to pee or something, yeah. It's like I have a need to be like, okay, well, how do we solve this? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't want answers and they don't want to solve it. They just want to bitch. Or in certain moments, right? Like when it's fresh, you know, if I'm really hurt about something, you know, Kevin, Kevin can go into fix mode or don't worry about it mode or whatever. And you're like, I just want to cry and have somebody hug me and hold me right now so that I can get through this one moment of self pity and, and victim moment. And then we can fix it later. Right. And that's where I think Jeff, you're attuned to your wife where, you know, sometimes you just want to know someone's there for you. And Katarina actually talked about that in her Ted talk as well. I think it's, it's being there for the person and letting them know that you understand and have empathy and you're seeing and hearing them Um, and yeah, it's, I think it's a little bit of the vulnerability issues that we have had, Stephen, where we've had no issues. What are you talking about? If we get vulnerable, then it's dangerous. So if we're just fixers, then we don't have to feel. Well, I think it's also the the self-frustration of not being able to fix yourself. Yeah. And that drives me crazy. Yeah, well, I think that rather than drive yourself crazy, then you need to reach out and get some help. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So we're going to leave it at that. (laughs) R is the biggest one. Relationships is the biggest factor in our own happiness. So find someone to be in the hole with you, Stephen. You know, it's like you don't have to be in that hole alone. You're fine to sit in that hole, but just do it with someone. It's going to really make a big difference. I'm just going to drag some people down with me. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. The depths of my darkness. (laughs) Well, I'm going to dye my hair black and wear mascara. I think that's my next step. I um I appreciate your vulnerability on the show. I think it helps a lot of people, as I was even seeing in the chat. Um, and uh, I thank all of you for joining us. I think this was uh, a really cool episode with Katerina. Thanks for finding her, um, Jeff. 
And yeah, totally. um, if you love the show, please help us out and share it with a friend. We're trying to get as many people on our our uh, Better Together train as possible. And if you can help us in that way, that would be so amazing. Um, share it with your social friends um, on social media. Share it with your whoever you love, um, whoever you take to your darkness, <laughs> your your deep darkness tunnels. Whoever you welcome into your hole. Whoever you welcome into your that is Stephen. <laughs> oh my lord! I got you. Oh my lord! I almost said it. Um, but anyhow, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, I realize it's only Monday. We still have more to go till we get to the weekend, but we're gonna make it a great week. And we are going to have amazing guests on this week as well. So um, did we have a good news video we were supposed to air? We I did. Yeah, we were going to do it's, it. It's queued up. We, we can still do it. We can make our way out with it if we want. Okay, what is it? It's it's so, I almost wept this morning. But as you all know, um, we, a lot of people aren't getting a graduation commencement ceremony. High schoolers, college students everywhere, even PhD students who have worked for years for their graduation don't get them. Oof. So a local man has been socially distancing, playing the graduation song on his trumpet, Aww. surprising people at their houses to give them a little graduation of their own. All right, play Steven, it, Steven. Have the video, yeah. Aww. <laughs> oh my God, I'm gonna cry. I know. so sweet oh man guys all right we end with tears but beautiful tears because people are beautiful and that's again from from tough times where we get to see the beauty um follow us at maria menounos at steven lemie photo at jeff crane graham at katarina blum and remember be nice people make good choices and be present